Today's show is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls and load balancers, a new managed Kubernetes service, and much more. From predictable pricing to flexible configurations to world-class customer support, you'll get access to all the infrastructure services you need to grow your business. Plus, DigitalOcean's community provides over 2,000 tutorials to help you stay up to date on the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. So to get started on DigitalOcean for free, with a free $50 credit, go to do.co slash cloudcast. That's do.co slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is The Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Good to be back with you again this week. And this is going to be the first of, we're going to do two shows this week. Um, not that we want to overwhelm you, but both of these, we had an opportunity to talk with a couple of the speakers who are giving very interesting talks, very uh, Cloudcast-centric uh, you know, listener talks that I think you'll be very interested in. We wanted to kind of get them both out this week. I uh, wish we could have gotten out a little bit earlier, but timing and scheduling happens. But uh, we're going to have two shows this week. They're going to kind of hit on a couple of very interesting topics. But before we get to those, we're going to get to our cloud news of the week. It's been a very busy couple of weeks here in the cloud. We're going to kind of summarize a couple of things that have hit since the last time we recorded or the last time that we had a chance to, to update the news. So um, a couple of big announcements coming out in terms of acquisitions. Uh, Palo Alto Networks was very, very busy the last couple of weeks. They made two acquisitions. They acquired both Twistlock, who is uh, very focused around security in the container space and microservices space. And they also acquired PureSec, which is very much around security in the serverless space. So Palo Alto Networks uh, making a big push around security for both containers and microservices, as well as serverless. So a couple of big acquisitions in that space, the Twistlock one in particular, uh, close to a half billion dollars uh, of, uh, of value. I think PureSec was around 60 or 70 billion, to, uh, 60 or 70 million dollars. So 500 million-ish for uh, for Twistlock and about 60 or 70 million for PureSec. So actually, coincidentally, we were almost about to have PureSec as a guest on the show just probably 24 hours before the acquisition happened. And unfortunately, we had to, we had to cancel that one. So we would have dove into those into their technology a little bit deeper, we may get them back on the show soon. A couple of other things that were interesting, you know, there was an article written up about with the Sprint and T-Mobile merger uh, getting finally getting regulatory approval uh, that uh, Amazon, not so much AWS, but Amazon is beginning to, again, further look into uh, becoming a wireless carrier or becoming more active in the wireless space. So, uh, you know, Amazon is seeing Another market where maybe some innovation could be an interesting thing. Uh, there's a, an article out there that was writing about this. So we always like to kind of highlight where um, Amazon is getting into new markets, as I know a lot of you follow Amazon. And then finally, we thought it was sort of interesting, uh, both M uh, Microsoft Azure and Oracle Cloud uh, had an announcement recently where they're teaming up to bring together some, some network and some connectivity between those two clouds. So uh, basically what they did was announce a partnership that is going to allow customers that want to run both types of applications, Microsoft applications or applications on the Azure cloud, along with applications on the Oracle cloud. So whether those are more traditional Oracle applications that have been moved to the Oracle cloud or maybe some of the newer SaaS types of applications, uh, putting some things in place to make it easier to bring those two types of applications together. And again, obviously, as we see the cloud providers, um, you know, looking at their competitive landscape, listening to their enterprise customers, enterprise customers telling them that not one cloud maybe fits all for every one of their applications. They're going to be making more demands on the cloud providers. And it's interesting to see these partnerships come together. So I kind of wanted to highlight those. I thought it was an interesting uh, thing coming together of two companies that, you know, if you went back a decade or even four or five years ago, uh, were very much bitter rivals and, uh, you know, still compete actively, but now doing some interesting thing with partnerships. So I uh, thought those were interesting pieces of news. A um, couple of things in terms of earnings, uh, Pivotal announced their earnings, uh, Cloudera announced their earnings, and MongoDB announced their earnings. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this show, actually. I'll recommend if you go over and talk, uh, listen to uh, a show that I recommend, uh, really enjoy, a show called Software Defined Talk. Uh, both Brandon and, uh, and Matt Ray talked about um, kind of the impact of these earnings, not so much on whether or not one earning specifically is going to impact these companies, but these earnings, I think, were an interesting indication of um, in the Pivotal's case, the transition of PaaS technologies to Kubernetes technology, so Cloud Foundry to 
the Kubernetes technologies. There were some interesting comments in from their CEO about the transition that company's having to make. Um, and then really kind of interesting transitions uh, with MongoDB around their Atlas cloud offering. So obviously there's a lot going on with open source projects versus cloud services. And do they compete? Can can the software company compete with the open source project? Can it compete with the cloud provider? And I think those guys did a really good job of kind of providing some insight um, you know, into both Mongo's offerings and uh, Cloudera slash Hortonworks offerings and some of the transitions that, again, all three of those companies are going through in terms of uh, the strength of the underlying communities for what they're working on, uh, but also the transition maybe that's going on either between one technology to another or between the open source project, offering it as commercial software, and then maybe getting into the business of offering those things as native cloud services in competing against the native uh, you know, public cloud services for those those technologies. So um, go take a listen to that show. It's a good show. I, I recommend it. I listen to it myself every week, uh, but I don't want to spend a lot of time digging into it or repeating what's been said over there. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm really looking forward to our first of two shows focused around the Velocity Conference. We're going to hit this first one around uh, machine learning and uh, technology called Kubeflow. So very excited to, to get into that one. Today's sponsor is Datadog the real-time monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and distributed request traces from your containers and orchestration software. Track the health and performance of your dynamic containers, apps, and services with rich visualizations and machine learning-driven alerts. Datadog's cluster agent streamlines data collection from large container clusters and allows you to auto-scale Kubernetes workloads based on any metric you've already collected with Datadog. To start monitoring your Kubernetes clusters, sign up for a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Visit datadoghq.com slash cloudcast to get started. And we're back. It's good to be back with everybody this week. We are have wrapped up all of the 4 for 400 shows. We thank everybody for listening. We thank everybody who had a chance to, to be a guest on the show and helped us get over that milestone. And now we're going to get back to kind of our normally regularly scheduled types of shows and topics and so forth. You know, and one of the things that we're always trying to find is, is the intersection of stuff that's getting a lot of buzz in the marketplace. So, you know, as you know, if you followed the show for a while... Uh, you know, AI and machine learning shows always gather a lot of interest from you. Um, I know people have different levels of expertise and interest. So anytime we get a chance to talk about machine learning and AI, it's always interesting. And then obviously, especially following the uh, KubeCon event that was going on in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago, which had its largest attendance ever, uh, nearly 8,000 people attending. Um, Folks know, you know, my day job, I'm very focused on Kubernetes. We talk about that on PodCTL. But anytime we get a chance to sort of intersect AI and ML and then Kubernetes, it's always a good day for us. So we thought, uh, you know, with the Velocity Conference coming up, uh, we looked at some of the topics that were out there and we get a chance to talk to some very smart people. We're going to take advantage of that. So very, very excited today to have David Aronchak join us. David is head of open source machine learning at Microsoft. David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, long time, first time. Uh, very excited to be here. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, so you have, you have a very interesting background, I think, in terms of Having worked in a lot of very large scale places on on some very complicated problems, uh, you've got a, an incredible background in terms of depth and breadth. But for folks that maybe don't know you or you know, don't follow you on Twitter or maybe haven't followed your work, give us a little bit of your background, how you not only got heavily involved with open source, but obviously now in, in machine learning and AI. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, you know, I really, uh, as, I, as I recount this, it really does seem to kind of like vary all over. Um, I've, I've both, uh, founded, uh, three companies, but then also, you know, so, so going to the smallest of the small, uh, but then also I've worked at, uh, Microsoft, uh, AWS, or excuse me, um, Amazon, uh, chef, uh, Google, and now back to Microsoft again. So, you know, the largest of the large, um, you know, in recent years, I was, uh, lucky enough to be the, I like to say the first non-founding PM on Kubernetes. I led the Kubernetes uh, open source project on behalf of Google um, for about three years. Uh, and obviously the, the growth there is, uh, you know, once a lot in a lifetime experience. Um, after about three years of that, I, I knew that I wanted to get into machine learning. I, I think that machine learning has an opportunity to, you know, really change the world and, and not in that tech bro way, really, you know, put, put tools in the hands of people who who actually understand their space and can do amazing things with it. Um, and, and, you know, I had the opportunity to combine that with the work that I was doing on Kubernetes and started the Kubeflow project, which is designed to, to make it much easier to use machine learning when you're on top of Kubernetes. 
I did that for a year at Google, and then I uh, came over to Azure to, um, uh, you know, not only help uh, our general theory on open source and and things like Kubeflow, uh, but also, you know, help bring all the services that Azure provides and support to um, uh, open source and and those communities as well. A very different Microsoft from when I was here the first time around. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Excellent, excellent. So before we dive into Kubeflow, because I think we're going to talk about that quite a bit, you're actually uh, giving a talk at the upcoming Velocity Conference around that. But I, I want to hit on on Azure a little bit. Um, you know, Azure is growing very quickly. Um, people know it as uh, you know worldwide cloud offering a ton of different services, and and obviously Microsoft has a, a very different outlook on open source these days as you know versus five years ago or ten years ago. What does it mean to be doing open source machine learning at Azure, how does that fit in with, you know, getting from say open source projects to them becoming either services of Azure or, uh, you know, the Microsoft and Azure teams making contributions to, to, you know, make the projects better kind of in both directions. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, for those that aren't, uh, deeply familiar with the machine learning space, uh, the reality is, is it, it came out of academia and it came out of, you know, uh, I, I like to put a slide up. The, the first machine learning computer, for better or worse, uh, was invented in like 1951. Um, so, you know, and, and since then, there have been so many iterations and, you know, ways to go at it and problem sets and all these kind of things. And in every stage of that evolution, the best work has always been given back to the community, whether or not it's academic papers uh, or frameworks or tooling uh, or services or things like that. Uh, open source is at the very heart of machine learning. Um, we at, at Azure, on top of that, are, you know, we're the first to say, geez, you know, um, there are amazing open source tools out there. And you know, we have thousands and thousands of customers. I think the first thing we better do is make sure that they are having a good time using those open source machine learning tools, regardless of where they are. So uh, we contribute upstream to um, public projects, um, you know, whether or not they're at the tooling level or the framework level or, or any of the various tools. Um, but then as a secondary effect, we also want to make sure that if you want to spin up a cluster or a service or a VM or something on Azure, you're able to do that in a really straightforward way. So uh, we make sure all the libraries work. We test it properly. We offer pre-installed things around uh, the our, our deep learning VMs, um, which, uh, you know, make it, you know, have all the packages installed for you, all those various things. So we just want to make it very easy to adopt it once you come here. Um, and then, you know, even beyond that, um, we offer a number of services for machine learning engineers. Um, uh, we have an Azure uh, profiling service that, that lets you submit your model and will profile it, you know, in a variety of ways. Uh, we have an automated data validation tool. We have a data drift tool. We have a whole set, a series of tools. Um, but in the spirit of uh, open source and being loosely coupled together, uh, you can take any one of those tools and run them, you know, on, on premises on your existing machine learning frameworks. You can plug in and out whatever you like. Um, obviously, you'll you'll pay for the compute used with us, but other than that, uh, the services work in in this you know uh, one off way, and that's also part of machine learning. So, look, some things like neural architecture search are really hard to build yourself. Maybe that's the only step you want as part of uh, your process or a model management service or something like that, and you're able to do that. So you can have your entire pipeline of machine learning be on premises, but just page out to us for one thing. And again, that's something else we do. So really. Open source at Azure is all about, number one, understanding where customers are, and then number two, helping them be better either with you know, our coding and, and tools and skills or by giving them services they can use um, wherever they are. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and I, I've noticed, um, not being a data scientist myself, but always kind of curiously poking around as, as new projects come out, I, I find that the the data science community and, and the machine learning community, while it can be very complicated stuff, tends to do a really, really good job of saying, look, um, we're going to do a bunch of hard work up front to make sure those first couple of steps you have uh, with this new project, with this new set of tools is simple. So like you said, you know, things that are prepackaged in VMs, tools that are sort of pre-built together, a bunch of uh, simple getting started things. So I, I kind of commend um, this space at, at realizing that, you know, if you don't get the first couple steps right, especially for people that, you know, may not want to know about all the underlying plumbing, 
Um, you know, I feel like they're doing a very good job to get people started in something that the further you get into it does become a, you know, can potentially become a complicated space. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, that's probably the biggest challenge that we have in machine learning. Uh, the reality is, is you see a paper or a news story every other day where you're like, well, geez, you know, this thing detected cancer or this thing, you know, did this amazing stat and that's awesome. We love it. But to ask a new data scientist to come on board and understand everything about that and get started is still way too challenging. And, um, you know, that, that's something that, that will be our forever uh, task to try and make better. Right, right. So let's talk a little about Kubeflow. Um, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that that was a project you had a chance to be around since day one. So for anybody that hasn't heard of Kubeflow, obviously, I'm pretty sure people have heard of Kubernetes these days. It's now going up its fifth, fifth, fifth year anniversary. Um, what is Kubeflow and, and kind of what's it intended to do? Yeah. So like I said, uh, like I, you know, we were just talking about um, as, as uh, interesting and as easy as it is to get going with a single model in Kubeflow, um, or excuse me, in, in machine learning, um, you can download some code and drop it in a Jupyter notebook and just go to town. Um, the reality is, is that most machine learning occurs in a, a pipeline where you have many steps that you want to wire together uh, in an intelligent way. Uh, when we first got started with Kubeflow, it was just, hey, you know, a whole bunch of people out there have um, single, you know, Kubernetes environments, and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, machine learning is particularly good at that, by the way, uh, because using all this space, uh, they know how to uh, scale out and, and do these various things. Um, and so we just made, wanted to make it easy to deploy and run a machine learning framework in a distributed way. It was, you know, again, far harder than it should have been uh, from the first moment. Yeah. That said, um, what Kubeflow has quickly uh, morphed into in, is this rich pipeline system. So as part of Kubeflow, you have an entire machine learning workflow orchestration system. Um, and the idea there is now, let's say you have data and you need to ingest it. They, maybe you need to transform it in some way, like convert all the dates from you know American to European format or something like that. Maybe you need to convert things uh, or group them together to build your features. Uh, then you execute an automated training step. Then you execute a packaging step and a deployment step. Very, very common stuff for machine learning to wire it all together. Um, Kubeflow gives you a rich first-class way to not just pick and choose packages that make sense to you, but then also to roll that out and make that very, very repeatable. And now what we say all the time is, if you have a Kubernetes environment, you know, uh, according to uh, conformant, according to the standards, uh, you sh should be able to deploy this rich end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline using standard, well-tested packages. Um, and, you know, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, I know um, when when Kubeflow first got started, it was uh, the, the flow part of it, I believe, came from its interaction with the TensorFlow project, which uh, had you know came out of Google, but has become this phenomenon on GitHub and in open source circles. Um, how has it evolved? Because as I as I dig into it more, it's not just uh, TensorFlow centric anymore. It's it's trying to bring in a bunch of things. But you know, like what did what did Kubeflow look like maybe a couple of years ago? And kind of how is how is it evolved um, because people have wanted to get more involved? There's a lot of contributors these days. Yeah, um, uh, n no harm on you, but uh, that that is actually a common misconception. Uh, uh, okay. And and but but it is <laughs> you can blame me. I name the stupid thing, and uh, <laughs> I'm the one who um, uh, you know kind of I guess somewhat caused the confusion. Um, the the idea was actually we were stealing from the concept the the same concept the same name that TensorFlow stole from right. In machine learning, there is this concept of flow. Um, and whenever you think of these workflow orchestration systems, uh, that's what we were really trying to get at. Uh, now, we certainly wanted to hint at TensorFlow, uh, but there were lots of other ones out there, FB Learner Flow, Airflow, which isn't even machine learning, and, and so on and so forth. There's, there's this idea that you're going to take a work stream and put push it all the way through. Uh, and that's certainly what TensorFlow does, specific to tensors in, in machine learning, but this was a much more general concept. Um, it is very machine learning friendly, and that's something that these pipelines know and understand, uh, making it 
much easier to roll out machine learning frameworks than using a, a generalized workflow orchestration. Um, but, you know, the, we, we were very proud to have, you know, PyTorch and MXNet and other non-TensorFlow operators even uh, available uh, from day one. It makes sense. And uh, I appreciate the correction. It, uh, it, it, it sort of, as I was digging into it, I was like, man, it went from, went from being TensorFlow centric to all these different things. I wonder why that happened, but that, uh, yeah, yeah, that no, no. It explains things very, very well. Again, it's, it's, you know, again, blame me. I, uh, I was the one who named it. I thought it was very cute and like, oh yeah, sure. We're, we're kind of like jumping on the flow bandwagon. Uh, but of course, TensorFlow, uh, certainly has, uh, the vast majority of the attention there. So, uh, you know, we, we certainly injected the, uh, uh, confusion. Yeah, no, that's okay. At least you didn't add less to it and make it like serverless or something. <laughs> right. So, right. Um, so for folks that, that are, uh, Kubernetes familiar, um, what what's the interaction between Kubeflow and Kubernetes? Is it is it an operator, which is kind of the, the rage these days? Is it uh, you know some specific type of of, uh, of job or you know kind of what's the interaction between Kubernetes and Kubeflow? Yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, in, in fact, it's all of the above. Um, uh, the way the Kubeflow uh, system works is you pick packages that makes sense to you. So like I said, maybe you have a, a data processing package or you have uh, you want to use TensorFlow or PyTorch and you pick that package. Then you maybe you want to serve your model. So you might use Selden or um, uh, you know, TensorFlow serving or a variety of things like that. Uh, maybe you, you want to do um, uh, distributed data processing. So you might use uh, Ricto, for example, uh, which is a package that people have checked in. So you, you pick and choose a series of packages that make sense to you. And you describe them using, you know, very straightforward YAML um, and deploy it. And and that deployment is, you know, well tested and understood. Now you asked how it overlaps with Kubernetes. Um, it's up to the package creator to decide what the best format is for that deployment. So with TensorFlow, for example, we have an operator that makes sense. And with uh, Selden, for example, that's just a standard deployment. And, and so that makes sense for them. Um, and that's part of the flexibility of the um, Kubeflow pipeline is that uh, you know, you pick and choose. You can add any arbitrary uh, system or container or something like that, and it knows how to run it. Uh, all you have to do is specify it, and and it'll go. Gotcha, makes sense. And I, and I think the the thing that you keep coming back to, and what's what's kind of resonating with me is you, you've really got to get this thing in your mind that that it's about pipelines. It's about, like you said, um, you know, sources of data, figuring out what sort of transformation you've got to do to the data building models, being, being iterative on those models as new data comes in and so forth. And it's, it's the pipeline concept that makes this the thing to really kind of understand. And then obviously, you know, scalability and so forth with, with Kubernetes then, then becomes the underlying piece of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, there's, there's, uh, a, a real understanding that's coming about right now. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, here at Azure, we, this is something we deeply embrace, uh, around a concept called M ML ops, uh, ML operations, um, and it, and you know one of the things that that I like to stress is you know almost no pipeline in the world, no machine learning pipeline in the world that you just described is single technology. Uh, you might choose uh, Kubeflow for this portion, you might choose uh, Spark for this portion over here, uh, you might choose a hosted service like uh, you know. Azure, you know, model management service, or maybe you deploy across multiple clouds, uh, Google and Azure and, you know, your own on-prem. Uh, and, and in machine learning, that kind of um, multifaceted deployment is so important because data scientists are always looking for the best tools. Um, and so you're going to see this constantly swap in and out. Uh, I think the only wrong answer, um, if, if you will, is uh, when a data scientist is kind of siloed away in their own, um, you know, environment, you know, monolithic environment, uh, because what we're seeing more often than not is you'll deploy this, you know, very large VM or VM like service and, and you'll run it, run it, run it. And oh, OK, it ran pretty well. Uh, and then it comes time to move to that production. And in fact, none of the things that they were working on there were either production ready or integrated into the service. And um, so you're seeing just a, a, a huge gap between the wisdom of that data scientist and, and people actually using it. 
Um, and so more often than not, you saw the same transition that occurred around DevOps. How do we get those data scientists without making them SREs into the overall process? And the way to do that is through things like MLOps and, and loosely coupled services that you can um, page together. Yeah, no, it makes, makes sense. And, and like you said, there's there's going to be different functional areas that people are going to have expertise in, tools they like, and, and it's important to be able to to make it somewhat modular so that they can you know work together. You can get a bunch of people involved. Um, I had a chance to read a very good uh, sort of summary from a woman named Thea Lampkin uh, who works around Kubeflow. I know you you know her. Um, yeah. That talks about the kind of the growth of the community, the expansion of the community. Um, for anybody that's uh, you know kind of coming around to this in a new space, give us a sense of. You know what? What does this community look like from an open source perspective, from a con- contribution perspective? Um, you know, just in terms of velocity, in terms of breadth, and so forth, so people have a sense of how how robust or active it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, I, honest to God, I, I couldn't have uh, dreamt about a better community than than what we're doing right now. Um, uh, you know, we have six. 6,900 GitHub stars. Um, we have, uh, I don't know, 30 different repos people are, cl- uh, you know, um, uh, contributing to, uh, you know, the, every one of the, the top uh, machine learning uh, companies is is contributing in some way. Um, and most of all, what I'm excited about is is really the, the pull requests and commits. Um, you know, as, as fast as that is accelerating and, and uh, as, as many new features are coming in, uh, there is no single company that represents the majority. Um, you know, even though this came out of Google uh, you, when I was there, um, you know, even within the first six months, uh, more than 50% of the, the uh, PRs, uh, the pull requests, were coming from non-Googlers. And now uh, when you look at the trailing uh, unique 28-day authors, um, less than uh, the 20% of them are, um, you know, Google authors. Uh, so again, that that really highlights how important it is to have a broad and diverse community where it's driven by not a single entity. Uh, you know, it's always a little bit suspicious when you have some open source project uh, and they claim, well, it's, it's open, but there's no governance. Uh, you know, every one of the top 10 could Contributors are from a single company, uh, and they, uh, you know, have have a commercial platform that they are um, backing. Uh, that that this everything defaults to. Uh, you got to you got to be a little bit sensitive, and and we tried from from the very beginning to make sure that that this would be the exact opposite. Yeah. No, I think, and uh, you know, if you, if you think about it, that sort of mirrors what went on with Kubernetes. It, it it started with Google, but it's you know it's got such a diverse set of contributors at this point that um, you know you feel like you're getting a lot of inputs from a lot of different places. It's not necessarily being driven by one platform, one agenda, you know, just or even just sort of one point of view, which I think is is really really important. Um, so you know, kind of hitting on the, the thing that you're doing with Velocity and depending on when people listen to this may or may not be relevant, uh, we'll put some offer codes for people that may want to get a chance to go out to Velocity. But um, for anybody that's that you're talking to new, they go, hey, this sounds really cool. I'm interested in data science or I dabble in these things. Kind of what's a, what's a framework that you sort of give people for, for getting started? If you were, you know, you sat down with somebody for an hour and you're like, hey, let me show you some things, teach you some things. What What might that framework look like in terms of, getting them started or highlight some things that they can go, this'll, this'll, this'll show you some, some powerful things right away. Yeah. You know, I, I think that that's such an interesting question. Again, it's one, one thing that we just struggle with on, um, uh, you know, in Kubeflow and, and data science generally, um, you know, you, you go, like I said, you go up to, you know, any blog from any major cloud provider, Azure or Google or, uh, what have you. And they're going to talk about some amazing new stat. Uh, you know, we have, 97% 97% accuracy when it comes to whatever, you know, voice transcription. Amazing. Uh, and people are like, well, okay, how do I do that? Right. Um, m- more often than not, I like people to get going very gradually. So what you want to do is you want to go and look up something called transfer learning. There are a number of very excellent uh, models out there that you can use as a starting point. Um, things like MobileNet or ImageNet or ResNet. Um, that let you, for example, uh, take an entire class of images, uh, drop them into 
folders. For example, uh, you know, I have a, a demo up uh, under my GitHub handle called uh, uh, Qflow and MLOps. And in it, we have a transfer learning example for, you know, comparing a taco versus a burrito. Uh, and uh, all you do is you drop a bunch of images of what are tacos and what are burritos, and then you go to town. And, and that really is it. But, but by doing that, you're able to go and explore, oh, okay, I get it. This is a pipeline, and this is how I take that existing model, and I retrain it with new data. And that is a really good starting point uh, because now you're getting some of the concepts that you're going to be involved with here, what training and retraining looks like. Uh, you might even find something useful. Uh, you know, Image detection or, or object classification uh, can be some of the most common and useful initial steps. Um, you definitely don't want to go out and, and try and build some 17-layer model with, you know, 3.1 million parameters. That's that's crazy town. Right. Uh, and, and it's almost never necessary to get started. You really want to start with a problem that makes sense to you and then go from there. And then you can expand over time um, into, you know, adding additional models, uh, maybe paging or uh, – uh, Combining models together into what's called ensemble models and things like that, um, where you know you're you're leveraging something that's already out there, but maybe you're changing just one element of it. Um, but you know, more than anything, it's just about getting started with something that's going to make sense to you and solve a problem that you might have. Yeah, no, I like that. I I, um, I I don't mean this as a criticism. I know sometimes when I talk to folks from Google, the word scale comes out 25, 30 times in, in every yeah. paragraph, and you just want to go look. Not everybody has that problem. So I appreciate that you, you're saying, look, uh, don't get yourself too wrapped around the axle, too enamored with, you know, I, I've, I've got 18 trillion data points and we've done this thing. It's like, get started, learn the basics. Uh, the tools are there. I think, you know, one of the really great things is, you know, as you mentioned, there are tools that you can get onto your laptop so you can do some things locally. Um, you know, most of the cloud providers, Azure included, uh, provide a really rich set of like free resources so that you, if you want to get started with stuff. Uh, there's great tutorials now out on Katakoda, which we've talked about before on the show. So um, I think the the thing that you're emphasizing, which is if you're interested in this space, start small, start with the things that you can get your hands on, start to understand it, and then you can expand. And, and as you mentioned, the community is is growing like crazy. So then there's people you can go you know, talk to and ask questions of. So Yeah, but, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, listen, I'm going to wrap it up with that. Uh, you know, Obviously, this is a, a topic that is very, very deep and rich. Uh, we put some things in the show notes for people that want to go dig into it. Um, if somebody wanted to reach out to you or where might they find you either, you know, on the Twitters or out at an event sometime soon that they might want to ask you a question. Absolutely. That, that is, uh, my absolute favorite thing. Um, you should reach out and, and let me know what I can do better and, and what questions I can ask. It is an incredibly complicated space. There's absolutely no question that is too dumb or too confusing. If, if we're not, uh, uh, answering your question or if it's, if it's confusing to you, it's confusing to 90% of the rest of the people. And so it's our job to make it less confusing. Uh, Twitter is probably the best way to reach out to me. It's just my last name, Aronchek. Uh, you can also reach me directly at Microsoft at uh, my first name, dot my last name, at Microsoft.com. And you're welcome to do that. Um, and then, you know, I try to get out and talk at a conference at least once a month. Um, and, you know, we have Velocity coming up. And uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to be in July. Actually, but in uh, August, I'm in Las Vegas, and we'll be back at KubeCon and, you know, all the things. Uh, so don't hesitate to grab me. Let me know what I can do to make things better or, or answer your questions. Uh, and most of all, uh, help bring that wisdom and in, in your questions back into the platform to make it better. Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, David, thank you so much for the time today, folks. As always, uh, we're always appreciative when uh, very smart people like David give us their time. Um, as always, thanks for telling a friend about the show. Thanks for helping us grow the show. Thank you to both Datadog and DigitalOcean for sponsoring today. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. We will talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 